Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hi, Tracy. Welcome to the Quest Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm excited about this interview today. I've wanted to get you on my podcast for a long time. This is a, a big season for me, so I've been like just pushing them out one after another, and I thought, I got to fit her in. I'm coming up close to episode 100. Wow, this, congratulations. I mean, season six, yeah, I'll have what, episode 100 will be coming out soon. I'm like, I got to fit her in before I take my like long break, you know? <laughs> well, I appreciate so, that. I was really happy when you uh, when you responded back and you wanted to come on because there's so much I want to get into with you. You're the first time I've ever had uh, a, a, a guest with kind of your pedigree on here. So I want to start by just having you tell the listeners a little about your education, your background, and kind of how... Uh, that developed into Inspector Planet, which is like the coolest name ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So I'll try to keep this as succinct as possible. So I have a BS, ME, and PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Florida, uh, number one ranked public university, by the way. Not many people know that. Um, but a very proud Florida Gator. Uh, and my journey through environmental engineering is is quite a long story, but it really started growing up near a hazardous waste dump site and learning about that and seeing the cancer clusters in in my town. Um, and that that really got me to need to explore environment and and figure out um, how to protect wildlife and human health. I, everything that we put into the environment eventually comes back to affect us. And I was kind of, a, got obsessed with that. Um, and Inspector Planet came to be because I had this 11 year old cousin that came over and she was obsessed with Kim Kardashian. She just was obsessed with the TV show, Instagram, everything. And I was like, Juliana, there's, there's better role models on TV, but <laughs> there weren't. I was looking for a female scientist on TV and there was nothing. Um, so I started writing blogs and and started putting down everything that I was doing with my research and everything that I was seeing in environment in Florida and New York where I'm from. Um, and, and I created Inspector Planet, which is a combination of sustainability and innovation. So Captain Planet and Inspector Gadget because true sustainability is gonna be near impossible for us to reach with entropy and changes and population growth. So the only way that we can get close to it is by innovating. We cause the problems, we can fix them. Yeah, for sure. You have a lot of hope that that's gonna happen. I'm not sure if I have that much hope, <laughs> but that's why you're here to change minds, right? Right. So, um, <laughs> you know, you mentioned not seeing like those role models on TV. And, uh, and I think you're right. Like I started to think like maybe like uh, maybe like Emily Calandrelli, like sh showing up on a couple of things on Netflix, like maybe that's the only person I can really think of. And that was recent. I mean, yeah. I'm talking back and, in 2014. Yeah. You know? And she's and she's more space than anything. Yeah. I think is her is her is her deal. Yeah. So, yeah, you definitely hit a, a kind of a niche with this. And that was really what appealed to me when I started seeing Inspector Planet show up in social media. I was like, "Who is this person? What is this about?" You know, and uh, and I I really liked it. So uh, technically, you gave me a lot of like a lot of alphabet letters of all your degrees and yeah and things that you have. But technically, do you call yourself an environmental engineer? Yeah. So I uh, environmental engineer and research scientist. I I'm an interdisciplinary scientist. Um, so I've done everything from stormwater, water, and wastewater design, which is the environmental engineering piece, um, to hydrology, developing water treatment technologies to remove pollutants from stormwater runoff. Uh, I did some storm chasing. And then I ran a research program at Marine Laboratory focused on microalgae. 
And from there, I went and worked with NASA to create an aquaponic system for space travel to clean wastewater, which is also environmental engineering. And now I'm the Coastal Modeling Portfolio Manager for the National Ocean Service. So I manage all of our modeling efforts from the bottom of the ocean all the way to, well, basically the sun because we use satellite imagery, but, but our models really go from the bottom of the ocean to storm surge. Sure, sure. When I hear the term environmental engineer, it sort of sounds like something out of a science fiction film, like you're going to terraform Mars or something. And it's like, it's such a cool title. <laughs> well, it, and that's, that's the thing. Yeah. That's who's terraforming Mars is the environmental engineers. The only things that we need to survive, food, water, shelter, the environmental engineers are the ones that provide that. And no one knows it. Everybody takes it for granted here in America. We just... Well, I shouldn't say all of America because we have places that don't have clean drinking water. But yeah, but it's a truly a miracle that I can just turn on my faucet that, you know, you just put your put your trash at the end of the road and some fairies take it away. Yeah. You know, you flush your toilet. All that stuff is because an environmental engineer was was behind the design. Yeah. You know, uh, one of my um, uh, one of my guilty pleasures is things like, you know, The Walking Dead and shows like apocalyptic things and zombies. And I often wonder, wow. How are humans really going to deal with this when you can't flush your toilet anymore and you can't you can't go to the grocery store and pick up a loaf of bread? Like, like people I think have no about idea. that. <laughs> I think about that all the time, and and survival and having those survival skills. I mean, you have a little bit of an advantage being an environmental engineer because I understand how to clean water, and that's one of the most important things. Yeah. Um, but but it's really interesting. There was a hurricane that hit South Florida, Southwest Florida in 2017, Hurricane Ian. And the response to people, I mean, a lot of people lost their lives. There was devastating, devastating, catastrophic impacts to our coastline. But the people that were more inland that just lost their power, it was really interesting to see what happened there. It turned, it seemed like it turned into a walking dead type of situation where people were stealing like right away right away i mean we can go many days without food but yet people were stealing food stealing water they had no idea what to do with themselves they were walking around aimlessly yeah and we've it's, really become so disconnected it's uh yeah it happens very there's a here's another old saying we're always um three meals away from anarchy hi <laughs> you know what <laughs> <laughs> that is a fantastic saying. And I saw yeah. a little bit of that yeah. up close and personal. You take away three meals from people and they're ready to revolt and rob their neighbor's house. Like it's really three meals away. Listeners take that. You can take that one if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see that go viral on, uh, on Instagram next week. Um, I read somewhere, uh, I believe I read somewhere, maybe on your website, or maybe it was something about you. I read something about your mission is to extend humanity's time on earth through environmental awareness. Is this your mission statement or what would you say your mission statement is for Inspector Planet? Yeah, that's a <laughs> it's a really good question and I've been revisiting that a lot recently. Um extending humanity's time on earth is kind of all encompassing. You know, the earth is going to be fine and it's going to, you know, it will balance itself and it's it's our quality of life and ability to get the things that we need to survive in the time that we need them be, you know, because we're changing the world long or so much quicker than we are actually evolving, you know, like, um, so, so that's kind of what, what that meant is extending our time here, here on earth through, um, and I said environmental awareness because a lot of these actions, uh, changes in regulations, um, design uh, mandates, all of this comes from the public being educated and, and standing up and saying, we're not voting for you unless this. Yeah. Um, so having, and, th and then even outside of that, just in everybody's daily lives, people don't realize how much water they use, how much waste they produce, you know, what their carbon footprint is, what their impact is. But if every single person is more aware of those impacts and they just change a little bit of their daily routines to be more sustainable. It goes a long way. Yeah. This next question, this might be a little bit of a loaded question, but 
In your opinion, what's the number one environmental problem facing the earth today? You know, that was, that is a really tough question. And I go back and forth, you know, between, between scientific literacy and, and understanding of, of scientific processes to just water, water in general, um, the quality of water, the quantity of water. So whether it's in the form of hurricanes or floods or drinking water or groundwater um, or water that ecosystems that we depend on, you know, need, uh, water, it, that's why I became a hydrologist, because at, at a young age, water seemed to be the answer to that question. I see. Are a lot of these, um, you know, environmental problems, are, are they kind of like maybe like dominoes leaning into each other? One problem feeds the next problem. Is that maybe part of the issue, too? Oh, yeah. There are no local problems. Hmm. There, there, <laughs> everything is interconnected. We are all one one system. And it's amazing how these systems kind of mimic, mimic as you go down lower from mm -hmm. the universe down to a cell. Um, and everything is interconnected. You know, the Florida red tide is a great example of that. You know, people were treating it like a lo local problem since the 1960s. They were yeah. trying to answer questions by taking spot samples in the Gulf of Mexico. You should probably say what red tide is. So Florida red tide is a toxic microalgae endemic to the Gulf of Mexico, meaning that it's only in the Gulf of Mexico. It releases a toxin that can cause mass wildlife fatalities. And the air, the toxin can actually aerosolize. It can attach onto sea salt particles in the air, move on shore with winds and cause respiratory irritation for healthy people. But for those with COPD or asthma, this could be very serious. And when we have a really intense bloom, it can cause more serious problems to even, even the healthy people. And in 2018, we had quite a severe Florida red tide and a freshwater toxic algae bloom that that resulted in Florida being in a state of emergency. Hmm. But red tide is such a such a perfect example of how everything is connected because these blooms are initiated by upwelling um, from hurricane events, storm events, or, or changes in temperature, um, they are influenced by Saharan dust coming over from Africa into the, into the Gulf of Mexico, bringing a micronutrient iron to a species of nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria in the Gulf of Mexico that then dies and feeds red tide. Or this mm. species name is Cronia brevis. Um, Ancient sinkholes, known as blue holes, might be bringing nutrients from onshore to feed these these blooms that start offshore at the ocean bottom. Um, currents. Uh, some people think that 40% of the U.S. that drains to the Mississippi Atchafalaya watershed, causing the second largest dead zone in the world, uh, might be bringing those nutrients that somehow make their way to where we think these blooms initiate. So, so red tide is a perfect example of a seemingly local issue that is an earth systems problem. It's very interesting that you, that you explained it that way. I love it. I've never heard anyone explain that, that, that way to me. Um, I think of, I hear climate change associated with human beings being the problem of it, the root of it. But what I kind of hear here is if maybe we weren't even on the planet, this might've still been happening. <laughs> is that like, are Red we? Tide? Yeah. Florida red tide. Yeah. I mean, so, so here's the thing with these blooms, they have been happening for hundreds of years. Okay. So yes, they, we would get Florida red tide, Corona brevis would likely still be in the Gulf of Mexico. The difference is our impacts. So our okay. impacts with nutrient runoff, uh, with land development, um, with uh, septic, with wastewater overflows, because we are building so close to to the ocean that the when it rains our pipes get inundated and you know too much water goes to the wastewater treatment plant they have to they have to release uh raw and mixed wastewater bringing those nutrient um, concentrations up and feeding florida red tide and we have a big big lake in the middle of florida that humans 
dammed so they can build and farm south of the lake. So now when the lake gets to a certain stage, it releases water to the east and to the west. To the west, it goes out to where Florida red tide could be. Um, and it's <laughs> after 100 years of agriculture and urban development and all of this, we have a situation where this massive lake is sometimes covered 95% with a cyanobacteria um, and recently dominated by a toxic species. And during one of those releases is when we had that water crisis. So it's not, so yes, red tide would be here even if we weren't, but we exacerbate the impacts. I see. Yeah. You're based, you're, you're based in Florida and, and so much of what you're talking about is Florida. Florida <laughs> yeah, right problems. now, yes. And it seems like Florida is like ground zero for environmental issues in the U.S. And this is like aside from like man-made disasters like Deepwater Horizon polluting everything, like that we're already contributing enough to natural disasters. But yeah. you all are kind of associated with sea level rise and the red tides and these mass fish die-offs, uh, yeah. one of which happening right now in Key West, which I want you to talk about in a second. Uh, last year, I remember hearing about 100 degree ocean temperatures. I was thinking... Yeah. That's hotter than I keep my hot tub at, you know, like yeah. crazy, crazy to think that. Um, and of course you already have hurricanes. So why I do guess, people live in Florida? Why Florida? <laughs> why is all this happening in Florida? You know? Um, but yeah, oh, let's, do, yeah, let's dive into that a little bit more about Florida's problems and why, like, I don't hear about this in Texas as much, even though you share the Gulf of Mexico, you know, I live in, uh, in New York most of the year and no one in Manhattan seems to be worried about sea level rise as oh, much as people should, in Florida. You know? They should be. Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. Manhattan's, Manhattan's rough, yeah. um, with the sea level rise. And so is DC. Um, and Charleston is getting bad. So everything that you just said really does happen. All of these other places. It's just that in Florida, Florida economy, our quality of life, the reason why people come to Florida is for our environment. It's for the beaches, it's for the water, it's for the plants, it's animals, all of the fish. You know, you go to Florida for all those things that are impacted by humans or environmental phenomena. And so when something happens, you know, like people see it, people are on the forefront of it. Um, in addition to that, you know, we are, you know, as far as the, the warmer temperatures, we're closer to the equator than other places. Um, uh, we have built, overbuilt, um, close to the coastline, and we have sea level rise. And we also have in some places uh, in southwest Florida, the, the ground sinking due to overpumping of groundwater. Um, so you have that twofold, uh, something similar, sort of similar is happening in DC. Um, but, but yeah, I think that the reason why you hear about all these environmental problems in Florida is just because of how important the environment is. When you look at air pollution maps or super fun sites, or, um, well, those, those are the first two that, that come to mind. Florida is not, not in the top. You know, we have we have better air quality due to how air currents work um, than other places. Uh, wildfires uh, happen less often. So this year or last year, you saw that the worst air quality was in the Northeast because of those Canadian wildfires. Um, Superfund sites, you see them in older industrial cities, uh, which are hazardous waste dump sites that have yeah. been deemed hazardous to the public and need to be cleaned up. Um, so... Yes, we have a lot of environmental problems. So does everyone else. The difference is we yell about it a lot more and we have a lot more water to deal with. Yeah. Um, I would guess maybe California probably has the most coastline in the country. Is Florida the second most? Do you know? You know um, okay, so... The state with the most coastline is like shocking. I think it might be like Maine. Like this is gonna, this really? is really gonna wow. shock you. Yeah. Um, let's We're gonna find look out. it up right now, folks. <laughs> while you're while you're looking that up, Alaska. Okay. It's Al oh, it's of course. Of right. course, it's Alaska. <laughs> but but yeah, I, for some reason. 
there's something about maybe navigational waters. I don't know. But it, yeah. And so mm -hmm. this list says Alaska and then Florida, number two. Florida's number two. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I see, the, and you know, you could probably, I can't speak to this in any, you know, 100% of surety, but I, I seem to recall seeing like uh, these models of the coastlines after, you know, massive sea level rise. And it looks like Florida loses half the state in that trade off. Oh yeah, um, probably worse than maybe any other any other part of the country. Is that fair to say? I mean, we have a lot of wetlands south of Lake Okeechobee. In fact, that used to be. I mean, even where the farmland is right now, obviously, because um, I said this earlier, used to be all wetland. So, so it was once covered with water, um, and and that's not surprising because of the elevation of the land there. You yeah. know, and we're not going to bring fill into the Everglades because it would destroy the Everglades. Um, but what Florida is doing, I, I think at one point it was like on a daily basis, they were bringing fill into Miami to try to build up that that coastline. And right now, you know, what's making the news is the cherry blossoms in D.C. and needing to take 158 out to rebuild the seawall. You know, we have, we have these problems all over the place. It's mm -hmm. just... Uh, you know, saltwater intrusion. Everybody freaks out when they hear about these bacteria counts and beach closures due to wastewater or yeah. sewage dumps. That happens along the entire coastline. Yeah. And people don't even know. Like, it's crazy. I lived in uh, in uh, Southern California for about 10 years. And it would be weird because I would go to the beach to surf and the next day the beach would be closed. And I thought, well, <laughs> yesterday was probably terrible too. <laughs> and I was yeah. in it. And I think, well, well, how was yesterday any different than probably how today is? So that's the thing, right? Okay, so you take, you, we take samples of water, bring them to a lab and analyze them. By the time we get the results back, it's three days later. Hmm. The beach might be just fine now, hmm. but we can't really go back in time to three days ago when it wasn't fine right. and close the beach. Right. So that's, that's the thing, like getting more um, real-time handheld bacteria it, it, in California, it's more like an acceptable amount of needles in the in the sand on the beach these days, more than oh, anything. Great. Great. <laughs> so, that's I'm, not, I'm less worried about the water than I am about walking on the sand. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's it, the homeless. The homeless problem is the worst in the country in California. So where do you know if you're homeless, where would you live? You live on the beach. Homeless. Yeah, I would probably the choose the beach. Yeah, so there's just really a lot of contaminants from, least, just from. Yeah. I was mentioning uh, in New York, uh, you know, lower Manhattan, people that have been to New York know that's the site of 9-11 Memorial, Freedom Tower. This is the part that's susceptible to, to sea level rise. Like, we're going to lose all of lower Manhattan. Oh, yeah. But nobody really brings it up. No one really talks about it. There were a couple of proposals in the last few years to build these enormous flood walls <clears throat> all around the bottom of lower Manhattan. And, uh, and everyone shot it down, all the developers, all the people that own the properties. They don't want it. They don't want giant walls to where you can't see the water from the park. Or it's going to block the view of people that's bought very expensive apartments, you know. So every time, politically, it gets shot down. And Manhattan that's is an so island. <laughs> that's so crazy because it, it, with every, you know, fraction of an inch of increase, the structural integrity of these buildings is being threatened. Their mm -hmm. water is being threatened. Yeah. I mean, well, in New York City, they get a lot of their water upstate from surface water sources. So, I mean, there's... That. And Manhattan has a sinking problem, too. Right. <laughs> right. So it has its own already, you know, creating its own set of issues that you've tunneled under it, you're building on top of it. You know, you have to be destroying the land of the island that you're on, this little tiny island. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I went to New York uh, about a month ago and I looked out. I was at one of those, you know, site viewing points and and I just looked out at all the impervious surface and I was like, oh, my gosh, like, how did we do this? Like, how how did we do that? How and and the stormwater engineering. That's going to get harder and harder without a gradient, like as the sea level rises. Mm -hmm. So like. I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about, I did work as, a, um, as a project engineer in White Plains, New York, and I worked on their water treatment reservoir, but I did not do civil engineering and stormwater engineering in the city itself. I think it'd be really interesting to see, but I had my own set of 
flat problems um, doing that in in Florida, uh, where again, it, it's crazy because if you look at Florida from a plane, you see a lot of green stuff, but still like we have mismanaged our land. We, we have been taking care of water quantity and not water quality. And we have basically built, built these situations where, where we hit a tipping point and then we have ecologic devastation and everybody's like, how did we get here? And it's like, we got here because we've been doing business as usual and no one wants to change anything. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I'm referring to the manatee deaths right now. Um, but you can attribute that to, I mean, you can also say that about fish kills and a whole bunch of other things. Let's talk about these uh, mass fish die-offs that are happening in, the, in Key West right now. What yeah. can you, what can you tell? Cause this is, well, this is happening right now. Tell me about this. What is this and can it be stopped? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of mystery around this one and that's why I think I'm so obsessed with it and always talking about it, always thinking about it. I mean, I was at space prom on Friday night in Washington DC and I like just ran into the house science community, but spent the entire night just talking about this issue because it truly is a mystery and we need answers. Um, My friend, Dr. Michael Parsons is um, funded through NOAA to do some event response work. Uh, He is a microbiologist and um, phytoplankton ecologist. So that's the leading hypothesis right now is that is that it's a microalgae bloom that is releasing a toxin called ciglatoxin. Um, but there's no smoke and gun. We've they've taken a whole bunch of samples and analyzed them, and there's no clear cause. And and the what's so alarming is that the fish washing up are are sawfish they're critically endangered and people rarely see them. Um, and so when they're washing up or dying at extremely high rates, people are very much alarmed. Now these fish kills aren't like from Florida red tide where you see just like piles and piles and tons of fish where you need trucks to take the, the dead fish mm-hmm. away from the beach before it, you know, contributes to more of the algae bloom. Um, these, uh, this is a little bit different. You're seeing the neurotoxic poisoning, which is the fish swimming in circles. And you're right. seeing, you know, spotty fish kills in, in several locations, but it's really that, you know, the sawfish, the rays. So you're getting those bottom feeders coming in and now you're seeing the other species of fish be affected. Um, and I have a, I have a hypothesis right now um and it's very similar to what happened in indian river lagoon did you hear about the manatee fatality event that we're still going through no no tell 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 me about that (laughs) okay so in 2021 we had this mass it started a mass uh, manatee mortality event and like thousands we lost thousands of manatees and this was after years of protections and getting the manatee out of endangered um, territory and they just started dying like crazy. And basically what happened is that a domino effect of change occurred about 10 years ago. There was a cold snap um, that may have killed off the seagrass and allowed algae to basically outcompete the seagrass and benthic organisms for nutrients. And this just kept on happening. The seagrass never got a chance to fully bounce back. And, and more and more, these algae species were dominating more. And then there was a regime shift in the algae species to more harmful or toxic producing um, species. And so all of that resulted in complete devastation of seagrass. So when the manatees, manatees look fat, but they actually have no fat, they're like all intestine. So during the winter, they come inland to the springs that remain at 72 degrees to feed. And they were coming in to feed, but there was no food. Um, So of course, charismatic megafauna inspire a huge reaction from the public and people want to know what they can do. Well, this ecosystem shift, this ecosystem devastation took years to produce. It's not going to be a quick fish fix. It's going to be like, it's going to take some time. And right now, like the manatees are being fed, people are feeding them with lettuce. So they have something to eat while they're trying to figure out how to Mm. 
restore these seagrasses, but you can't restore the seagrasses without restoring the water quality. And to do that right now, even though there might not have been a, a change in nutrient load to the Indian River Lagoon, there was a change in who was uptaking the nutrients. So in order to let the seagrass grow back, there's going to have to be some engineering, environmental engineering. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so so I'm thinking that a similar thing is happening down here. So we had that heat wave. Um, and now only only one particular like shallow bay hit that 100 degree mark, you know, but it was still right. higher than average. It was still a heat wave, so much so that we had the coral bleaching and coral death. Um, to the point where scientists were taking the coral into labs to save it so they can reacclimate it after after the heat wave. Well, whenever you remove the base of the ecosystem, like what happened in the Indian River Lagoon with the benthic organisms and the seagrasses, you're going to change the entire ecosystem. You're going to cause shifts and changes. Um, and in the absence of, you know, copepods or or certain fish species in the absence of that balanced ecosystem that a coral reef provides, it may have allowed for a microscopic algae to, you know, uh, um, to proliferate, I guess. Um, Gambier discus is the, the suspected microalgae that is producing toxin, but that toxin has never been known to cause huge problems. Um, so, and they're not finding high concentrations of it. So there's a couple things that can be happening. First of all, it could be a microscopic toxic algae species that we don't, that we're not identifying because we, it hasn't been identified yet. Um, it could be that species under different conditions either produce toxins or don't produce toxins. And if they produce toxins, depending on the environmental conditions and the stresses, they produce different toxins and different amounts of different toxins. So it might just be that, you know, and I'm not sure about the toxin analysis that was performed and if they did a GC mass spec and, and back, you know, basically back calculated the, the chemistry um, from those tests. But, but that might be a possibility that it's a chemical that they're not looking for. So a lot of these water quality tests, you need to know what you're looking for to find out it's, if it's there. Let's let's talk about algae for just a second. <clears throat> is algae a good guy or a bad guy? Is it is it an invasive species? Is it is it needed because you hear so many problems associated with algae, but is it Yeah, I mean how should a, I think of it? That's a great question. I mean, is <clears throat> chocolate cake a good guy or a bad guy? <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, you know, you go to you go to Georgia and you see the kudzu everywhere. And it's like the kudzu just overtakes everything and canopies the trees and kills stuff. And the yeah. Spanish moss in Savannah was brought over to be a landscaping tool and it's taken over the trees, although pretty right. uh, and not as bad as kudzu is algae like that. I, you know, I grew up when I was a little boy, there were three ponds behind my house and most years the ponds would be clear. And then every couple of seasons it would be covered in algae. You wouldn't, there would be no fish, there'd be no movement, everything was still. And it was like, this is, this is bad, this is terrible stuff. Like, there's not even a moderate amount of it. It's just all or nothing. So, and that's, that's so interesting that you said that about the, the ponds behind your house, because that's a perfect example. Some years it was perfectly clear. And then some years, like, biology is so interesting, like that, right? And mm -hmm. the life cycle and all the different pieces that come together to allow, uh, productivity in a, in an algae species. It's just, it's, it's really super interesting, which is why it's so difficult for us to, to model because even in singular, single cellular organisms, I mean, they, one could be different from another in, you know, their, their resilience or their, um, their feeding, uh, like how much nutrients they use. It, it's just so interesting. Um, but algae is a algae is a really important thing. Algae were created. I mean, it was it was responsible for the great oxidation event. It, it produces oxygen, most of the oxygen over millennial, or over millennia. So it's um, it's really it's a it provides ecosystem health in so many cases. It's just you know like anything else, too much of a good thing ends up being a bad thing. Like chocolate, chocolate cake. 
<laughs> I want it. So it, this inspector planet, um, the empire that you're building, how do we, how do we reach people to want to get them involved? Because I grew up along the Ohio river. There was a famous flood, the 37 flood flooded all the communities all along the Ohio river. And now there's measures in place to stop that kind of catastrophic flooding. You know, it's one of those hundred year floods that you hear about, but I grew up around water. How do you tell someone in Kansas to worry about uh, climate change or sea level rise? Like how do we reach people to, to think of this as a problem? When you're not well, on a major waterway or you're not, you're kind of landlocked. How do we, how do we get people to listen to this? It's, I, I love how you said that because it sounded so similar to something I always say. I always say how everything is connected. And I use that, you know, 40% of the U S goes to the Mississippi ash violated watershed and we talk about the dead zone. And then I say, how do we get a farmer in Iowa to care about a shellfish farmer in Louisiana? And that's where that increase of education and empathy come come to play. And and you know, as we as we evolve, we are getting more empathetic because it's it's we're realizing that it's a selfish thing. All these systems are connected. And if we take care of the downstream, if we if we make changes to take care of the downstream, we get that back because we like to eat shrimp, you know, or or that person in Kansas, you know, they might not be affected by sea level rise, but they will be affected by, you know, the price of the fi their fish if they eat fish mm -hmm. or by the changes in intensity or frequency of tornadoes if if that shifts towards a place where, where they are, which, I mean, it's kind of moving to the south, southeast, but you know what I mean? Like everybody sure. experiences environmental impacts in one way or another. Um, whether it's, you know, water quality, air quality, and it's all connected. And so the climate, the changing temperatures, I mean, that's, it, it, that's connected to everything as well. I want to, I want to talk about Al Gore's documentary in Inconvenient Truth. I'm assuming you've seen this. <laughs> yeah. I saw it when it, when it came out back in 2004, was it's it? It's been a while back, right? Yeah. Um, My mom took me. Yeah. <laughs> You're really aging me right now. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, um, I'm significantly older than you. I'm 50, 54 years old. and um, Oh, you look really good for 54. Let me you. tell you that. Thank you. Wow. Um, and, you know, I grew up, it, you know, in the late 70s, it was ecology was the thing. You know, like every generation kind of got another way to call it it's green so or it's this or this or this and it's almost like it's a fad okay let's get everyone on the recycling bandwagon and saving the planet and then it sort of right. just dies off right like your inspector planet the cartoon captain planet that's yeah. what that was about right it was trying to say but even that cartoon's gone like it's so it's like clearly this stuff becomes in people's rear view but yeah. they never really seemingly has we never really have any solutions in fact it seems like our problems are more and what i want to say about <laughs> So Sam, I hate to have this cup as half empty point of view, but if you listen <laughs> to my really podcast, funny. I do this a lot with people because I think it brings up a good conversation. Um, when I got done watching Al Gore's documentary, I almost felt like the pro it was hopeless. Like everything he laid out to me, especially with developing nations, I was just like, well, why bother? <laughs> like I was, right. I think he wanted everyone to get inspired to save the world. And I was just like, this is insurmountable. Like there's right. no amount of money. There's no amount of governments that the governance that I, we can ever do to police the world, to stop all the stuff that has to be stopped while our population keeps exploding and exploding and exploding. Am I wrong on this? Is it no, is this I one mean, of these things? He didn't really show the flip side. And I think Seaspiracy did the same thing. And that's, that's what's tough when, um, an activist is giving a narrative. Um, but the one thing that I really appre appreciate, and I, for years, I was like, the worst thing that happened to climate change was a politician getting involved. Um, <laughs> but what I appreciate about that documentary is the fact that he did, he went to real scientists. Mm -hmm. He was never trying to be the expert. He never posed himself as the expert. Um, but, but it's tough. It, it was tough back then because I remember 2004. 
I remember we were divided back then too, uh, politically. And it's even worse now. And it's like, if we are going to put these things in the politicians' hands to be, you know, pro or anti, we're never going to get anywhere, you know, because we are, <laughs> we've created, <laughs> politicians have created a situation where it's 50 50 um, by whichever side they pick on whatever things, you know what I mean? And in, in my opinion, they're all, contradicting of each other so it just seems to me it seems like manipulation so i'm very mm -hmm. much independent um and i you know look at facts uh but but i think that it is dangerous for people to send a message that is so doom and gloom that people just want to give up like what's the point and we are doing that a lot and now scientists that are actually working on climate change are trying to, to combat that by saying, listen, there's plenty of hope. There's a ton of things for us to do. Um, and then you have a group of people that are like, well, I don't really care because by the time I'm dead, I'm not going to see any of these impacts. Hmm. And I feel like the older that we get, the more we have that attitude. And that's, that's what scares me because I even see it in myself sometimes. You know, I, I see a little, I, I feel a little bit of pessimism, which I never had before. And I'm like, how I, I can't, I can't do that. Like I need to fight against that and I need to figure out how, so I can, so I can send a message or do whatever needs to be done, at least to the people around me, you know, to keep their hope alive. That happens generationally, you know, young people fight for causes and then they get older and they get cynical about it. <laughs> You're exactly right. But you know mm -hmm. why? Because there was never a quick fix. Mm -hmm. um, There's not a quick fix, no. And no. it's unfortunate because the U.S. is probably a country in the best position to clean the world up. But unfortunately, as long as there's a system of rich people that can lobby, right. you get to have the laws written the way you want. And that will never change things. That want their views mm -hmm. and want their, you know. The, the money train is more important than, you know their access to water sometimes but i'm there's, telling you that will be our demise and and the thing about human beings is they can rally in the face of their immediate extinction <laughs> they Wait, when it's too late when it's yeah, too when late they, when they see their inevitable demise they go well you know what we, we, gotta we should do something <laughs> <laughs> should do something and it doesn't matter what if there's an asteroid hurtling at the earth they'll figure out armageddon style like that movie you know how to get Ben Affleck up to the asteroid and destroy it. They'll they'll figure it out at the last minute. Right. Hopefully. <laughs> Half Hopefully. the earth will be destroyed, but they'll they'll get it done. Like don't look up. Have you ever seen that movie? Oh yeah. 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 You know, I wasn't sure if I would like that movie, but boy, it really it was so suspenseful for one. And then, you know, like all the Teslas ramming into each other. All this, it was that just was... like crazy seeing what they came up with for that and uh how technologically dependent we are and how fragile that system could be. Oh yeah. Have you ever lost your phone? Oh, yeah. People, you know, if you <laughs> if we lost Instagram for a week, there would be suicides. People would kill oh, themselves God. if they couldn't. I, I try to, you know, I, one of the companies I have is a management group. And I try to tell people that come on, particularly people that work in the influencer communicator community is, man, you got to have like a brick and mortar backup for this. Because if TikTok's gone tomorrow and you lose a million people, your company's gone. You're over. You know, you like, don't. Think about that or even lose popularity or get canceled or just, you know, people are just sick of it. Yeah. Yeah. When you're on someone else's platform like that, you're at the mercy of whatever happens with that platform. And TikTok is on the chopping block from week to week. And it's like, you know, you got to have more going on out there. You have to have your dot com set up because no one's going to take that away from you. And you have to have the ability to sell your own product. And I try to, and this is kind of off topic. So I'll just say this real fast and we'll move on. But I try to tell people social media is a billboard. That points to where the real stuff is. You know, that's what it's for. It's a billboard on the side of the road that says, you know, so and so next exit. And that exit is your dot com because you can't really sell anything on Instagram. You need to make compelling posts, but it still has to point somewhere. It points to where your book is for sale. It points yeah. to where people can download something that you have. It points to, you know, where the content is on your website or tell people how to book you for something, a speaking event or whatnot, you know. But people tend to want to just put it all in all in on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or what have you. Well, I mean, advertising, if you if you look at marketing in general and the percentage of funding that goes to 
advertising compared to the actual development process. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's shocking. And, yeah. and there's a reason for it. You know, I get tricked into buying things on Instagram all the time. <laughs> like I'm cutting myself off. <laughs> like I'm disconnecting all my credit cards from my Apple pay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have a little shopping addiction on Instagram. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Cause I don't go into stores cause I don't like yeah. to drive anywhere and I don't like to be in a store. Yeah. But the thing is like environmentally, and that's what I, that's the thing that I was talking about, like getting lazy. Like that is the most environmentally unfriendly thing I can possibly do. And granted I'm buying all sustainable products, but it still has to make it to me and I don't need them. That's the thing. Like the best thing that you can do for your health, for your physical fitness and for the planet, it's all the same stuff. Only consume what you need yeah. and consume all the natural stuff, you know? You know, you mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned uh, having things delivered to your house and sustainability. And, and, and I often uh, argue with people over whether electric vehicles will ever really get any kind of market share. And uh, I had a nuclear physicist on my show a, a while back, and um, and he he doesn't think that our power grid can support everyone going 100% electric, that we're just not built for that unless we go nuclear, that we have to have a nuclear backbone to do that. But I, I think that there's actually a wild card in this that people haven't really thought about. And I think that the oil producing nations will drop their costs on barrels of oil before electric ever picks up. I think if they ever see a significant market share, they'll say, okay, barrel of, you know, a barrel of oil is now, uh, you know, 10 bucks and you can gas your car up for a quarter. Like it'll completely change the city. They'll destroy it. But then eventually they'll run out. We don't know when, (laughs) but, but you know, it's another thing too. It's like, you have to also think about, uh, you know, oil, the petroleum we need for plastics and all kinds of other things like, what the oil is used for um, just in general and, and how we'll adapt to that moving forward. But anyways, I always think about that, that, you know, Tesla thinks they'll get market share until the Arabs say, okay, gas is going to be super cheap guys. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I actually think that uh, these are all just stepping stones to the next technology. Yeah. Whatever that's going to be. I mean, there's, there's promising, uh, it's, you know, things haven't proven to be scalable yet, but that's what science is all about. You know, this is, this is why you and I should have a podcast together because your cup is half full. I'm cup is half empty because I think it's a stepping stone to the end. (laughs) And I think we're going to be riding cars like Fred Flintstone using our feet to be pushing it along because I think that's probably where we're more likely headed. Uh (laughs) Yeah. I mean, here's the thing that would save a lot of problems, right? (laughs) A de-evolution of our species. Right. To, uh, the stone ages, everyone's on the same level. I mean, with working from home these days, it's absolutely possible. I mean, think about all the exercise we would get, except do you think that people would get more exercise or they just wouldn't go anywhere? You know, I, I, we were talking about the, the walking dead uh, uh, earlier, but either maybe at the beginning of this or before the show. And I, you know, one thing I find interesting about the walking dead is anytime they've cast an actor who's fairly heavy, because I don't think we're going to see heavy people in that apocalypse when there's like no food, it's like, everyone should be like emaciated then. And I think we're not going to be sitting at home going to crap. I think we're going to be trying to get every morsel of food we can with a lot of bad experimentation going on of what you can and can't eat. I think people will be eating cardboard. They'll be picking a poison berry. I think we're going to have a lot of issues before learning how to garden. I think so. In fact, I think, I think I, you, you picked the wrong fight here to talk to me about the apocalypse, but, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, is any apocalyptic situation, there's yeah. going to be the wild West for a while, the looting and the robbing and you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, kill, yeah. killing your neighbor so you can feed your dog. Like, and then they'll hit a peak and then, you know, people will organize and there will be a gang mentality and there, you know, and, and if you think that the cops are going to show up to help you, Self-preservation is the first thing that doctors and cops are going to think about. They're gone. Like they're still you, humans. Yeah, they're they're going to lay their they're badges no down in their job out. if they're not you're, getting paid. You're not going <laughs> to the hospital to find a doctor. Right. And and uh, um and so I think there's going to be all that. But like, it, let's say for instance things mellow out and you do start a garden, someone's going to come kill you and take your tomato plants. Like oh I just don't. God. I just don't foresee there ever being enough cycles 
to allow for even gardening to happen. Uh, and, you know, yeah. again, cup is half empty point of view here. <laughs> really, think, think about this. Think about having your, your garden in your backyard. You know, it's all cute. Maybe you have some, like, you know, fake birds in there and stuff. And then you have to man it all night long. They have, like, armed guards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> manning this cute little garden where you grow your lettuce and carrots. Just to have the bunnies show up and eat them when you're not paying attention. Right. And then you montage to that, you know, that scene where these two little kids try to steal some tomatoes because they're so hungry from your garden. And then you have to make the decision to kill them or not. It's a, I mean, I think we've seen this movie before. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, listeners, send me an email. Would you kill the kids or not kill the kids? I think I'm really curious what everyone would do. <clears throat> so, uh, we'll revisit this for sure. Right. But will there be a poll at the end of this at the end of this podcast? What would you do? <clears throat> um, so let's let's segue over to as we're getting close to the end of the interview. Let's segue over to more pleasant, yeah. uh, fun stuff because there were some other things I found in your in your career I want to bring up. <clears throat> you were a finalist to become an astronaut for a SpaceX civilian mission to the moon, which it didn't wind up happening. I think it's canceled now, but. Oh, it's completely canceled. <clears throat> yeah. They, because oh. they picked the finalist and then they said, well, Tesla is still developing, you know, their big rocket. Starship. And they, it's, yeah. it's, so it's sort of off, off the table right now to go to the moon. Well, Steve Aoki, I think you're so <clears throat> much cooler than me. Yeah. You know, it was you, we share a, a love for South Park. I, I see a South Park episode in the future where they launch, you know, uh, Kim Kardashian and uh, and Steve Aoki and like a whole bunch of other people and then it blows up before it ever gets to the moon. Like, uh, see, there's <laughs> like uh, if they're the world's this, uh... the world's best entertainers are going to go out with a bang, you know. Oh my god! But tell me a tell me about that because this is really cool. This so this was going to be a civilian trip to the moon. I mean, how yeah. how serious was this? I mean, uh, obviously, you know w w who's Who's prepared for this? How do you train for this? How do you tell me about that experience? Yeah. I mean, there are millions that apply to that. Hmm. Um, so to get past the first round, second round, third round, I mean, that was like, it was a, it was the most exciting time. I didn't sleep at all. And it was when that song astronaut in the ocean was big. So like, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm an ocean scientist and I'm going to be an astronaut. It's like meant to be, uh, and, you know, the health screening was really interesting. Um, that was really interesting because they were worried about my heart because my dad had passed of a heart attack. Hmm. And, and like it was, they were extremely concerned, which concerned me because apparently astronauts have had a higher percentage of heart disease almost every single one has had str stress on their heart mm. coming back um and i thought that that was really interesting but you know the training wasn't going to start until until it was closer to the uh launch so i didn't get to do the training however um i i am going to train at a facility um a dome facility, I think it's in Arizona, it is in Arizona, where I get to learn how to, you know, handle the spacesuits. Uh, and we do that by putting on the spacesuits going underwater. So it's basically going to be like learning how to dive again, but weirder. So is this a pipe dream for you? Is this a, like a bucket list item? Like, you do you want to go to space? Do you want to if you could go to Mars, if someone said, we're going to put you on a rocket, go to Mars, would you, would you do it? Like, this well, is crazy. Only, so the thing is, I, I am not one of those people that always wanted to go to space since I was little. I wanted to take care of Earth. Hmm. Um, but everything kind of changed when I started working with NASA. When NASA approached me to, um, to, to build the aquaponic system for wastewater treatment. And what the PI Luke Robertson said is he was like, listen, he was like, you know, this is, this is for Mars technically. However, you know, really this is for the Indian River Lagoon. This is for Lake Okeechobee. This is for third world countries that 
need an aquaponic system in areas that they don't have food, they don't have water, and can lose no water to evaporation and have to use every single drop. And that's the thing, like, space research pushes the boundaries of sustainability. And it's because they can't waste anything in space. What you take up there is what you have. You have to reuse every single drop of water. And mm -hmm. so space research is for Earth. Um, and the reason why or what would make me want to go to space so badly, and I can't, you know, I say this now, but when I was going to go to space just to go to space, I was super excited. Don't get me wrong. But really, I, I feel like if I'm going to make that trek, I want it to be to perform world changing research. You know, like it mm -hmm. would be for scientific reasons. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, what about you? Do you want to go to space? When I was a boy, I was just consumed with wanting to be an astronaut. Ah, there you go. See, yeah, I, for a long me. time, all the way up to all the way up to high school, I was in an ROTC program in high school in Air Force ROTC. Oh, that's that was cool. my, that was my plan, you know, to go, you know, through the Air Force, try to become a pilot, try to go in an astronaut program, but you know, things started to fall apart. My vision wasn't right. I was too t tall to fly an airplane. Like it was like one thing after another started You're to, too tall to fly an airplane? That's yeah. a thing? Yeah. Well, at the time, maybe not now, but at that time, yeah. in the late 80s, I was 6'2", I was too tall. Oh, my god! Pilots needed to be within a certain range because of the way the cockpits were built. So, so interesting. So it was like my vision wasn't where it needed to be. I wouldn't be able to fly. Like, And then, you know, the dreams started to shift and go other places. And, uh, and but now I was in... you, can, you can do bad eyesight. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. is crazy. And, yeah. I mean, you can get your eyes fixed and a million other things that you can do. But, you know, I... You know, I wasn't, I, the, the Apollo program was over by the time I was born, but I was there for the whole shuttle program. And uh, it was just amazing to see that because we started to, you know, it was the first time that I really started to see the future look like what the movies were wanting it to be, you know? And I see that again now with Elon Musk, you know, take it or leave it, how people feel about him. Yeah. But he's making he's making the future look like what we were told it would look like. Yeah. We're getting Star Trek world from him. You know, and he's adding some style into stuff and he's making stuff that works. So like, it's like, he's giving us, it's like, we need these types of minds to show up every once in a while to remind people, you know, this is what we're supposed to move toward. Yeah. It's funny because when shows like Star Trek, the next generation came out, you know, wireless technologies started to happen. Like Bluetooth was developed by people that watch Star Trek and said, let's figure out how we can touch this and have it communicate. Like people were designing things because of how they saw it in a science fiction show. And it made them think about, wow, I wonder if we could really make that, you know, yeah. starts with a writer and you visualize it on a TV show or in a film. And then before you know it, Kubrick stuff is happening and the space suits are looking like those space yeah. suits and we're able to do the stuff that we can, you know, it's so cool that you said that because recently, especially, I've been dealing with the fact that, you know, certain people in the science community, like, want to give me a hard time about doing TV, about doing the science communication. I, I, as my supervisor literally asked me if I was trying to be famous by running a kid's camp. I was like, what? No, no. He's like, well, if you're doing this stuff, what are you not doing? And I'm like, what? I'm like literally taking my vacation and filming on weekends. Like I film a handful of days a, a year yeah. and, and I'm like, you, you, you do that. You have kids, you know, you do your thing, your thing. You know, I, I spend time with kids like during my camp for eight days a year, eight days a year. You got them all the time. Mm -hmm. I go home at night. Like why are you judging me about what I do in my personal life? But the thing is they do. They 100% do. But what you just said was so important because, because doing that kind of stuff, being a scientist on TV, it can have impacts that, you know, don't show up right away and show up mm -hmm. down the road. And you yeah. have no idea. It that, inspires another generation as well. Yeah. 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 It, even just another idea. And it's not always like you doing it. It's what you're doing, the information yeah. that you're giving them, the, the views of the ocean and the sharks, you know, like, I don't know. It's TV is, is powerful in weird ways. And a, a lot of things about the industry suck. 
Don't get me wrong. But I don't regret. Eh. I had I had a couple rough experiences with filming, but but I don't regret any of the shows that I've done. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, it, it's it's funny what you said. Your you know your boss said to you there because I I think for the most part I'm I'm uh, I'm hesitant to support social media, but I kind of get it because I was there from the birth of email. America Online, which I consider the first social media, honestly. Oh, yeah, totally. It was, you know, if you look at Facebook's old interface, it's like exactly AOL. It's like, dude, this is exactly the same thing. And, you know, it was there for the MySpace revolution and Facebook picking up and all the things that, you know, if you think it will last, it won't because we've seen enormous companies like this fold virtually overnight. And the hundreds of millions of people that followed you, you're now not like, it's not about that right but i did see the best in social media during covid during lockdown and i remember and i was in manhattan during during lockdown and it was you know we were a giant petri dish of people living literally living on top of each other like it was insane we were ground zero in america for it there weren't even homeless people on the streets a lot of people don't know this but like the city actually came in and they picked up all the homeless and they put them on one of the islands and gave them showers and food. There was not even a homeless person on the street. You could walk. Oh my for, gosh! You could walk for four or five blocks and not see a person. And then when you did see someone, it was someone out walking their dog. And, wow! Uh, and it was like a ghost town. It was really, really crazy. But but what was really interesting was I think because people really didn't know what was going to happen if we would just go extinct as a species or whether they would ever have jobs to go back to. I felt really bad for people that lived alone and didn't have anyone. Yeah. You know, like there was a lot of a lot of issues, and I think it's going to take decades for this to unfold as to how it affected a generation of people, kids that couldn't go to their proms, couldn't do their graduations, like just from yeah. the kid standpoint alone. Um, but I kind of saw the best in social media because I would see comedians just, you know, do do twenty minutes from their living room just to make people laugh, and I I saw prima ballerina friends of mine, the New York City Ballet, that were doing ballet from their from their kitchens just that's to do so it for cool people. and i would see people would teach things yoga instructors and dancers yeah. teaching for free before there was really a way to do it on zoom because zoom kind of like came out of that whole world yeah zoom kind of uh blew up from there and the ways to be able to do things virtually but i kind of for a moment in time i saw what we could really do with social media and the reach it could have yeah. so imagine if we can entertain as we educate right because that's really the goal you entertain people with what you're talking about. Oh, you've got them wanting to support causes of, you know, for water conservation all over the world, you know, you can get them to. And, uh, and, and I think that that's really the key. And I don't think there's anything wrong with camps for kids or, uh, you know, being a communicator of a particular mission, just make it fun for people and they'll learn and they'll want to follow it. And you know what, if you have, I always look at the social media numbers like this, you get 10% of whoever's following you. That's what it is. Right. You know, if you have 100 people following you, 10 of them really care what you're doing. The rest have just clicked the button. They may or may not pay attention. You get a million people. Hey, that 10% gets a lot bigger. And that's what it's about, right? You're putting butts in the seats for what your, what your, uh, you know, what your brand is. And if it's making a difference, it's making a difference. Because we have to get past these Gen Z kids that are totally lazy and the next generation may try to save the planet. Right. Right. (laughs) That's terrible. Um, but, I want but, to go it's, back. but it's true. They were given, they were, they had it um, just, and I, you can't make a blanket statement for everybody, but, mm-hmm. but compared to the wealth of mm-hmm. my grandparents that went through the great depression, you know, it's just a totally different mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And just circling back to Elon Musk one more time is like, Elon wasn't like a one trick pony with just like, let's do electric cars. It was what he created with SpaceX. It's stuff he did with the with the tunnel system and wanting to have you know high speed, uh, you know a re- high speed rail Hyperloop. system and like yeah. like Hyperloop and all this. Like it's just he keeps churning out ideas that he keeps building. And I don't even know what's in his head that he has. It's just on paper at this point. Like I'm well, really interested in seeing. Yeah, and the thing is, he's not doing it alone. Hmm? You know, he the smartest people hire the right people, mm-hmm. hire the best. people people to do the job yeah and if you see someone else that's smarter than you or you know competition the 
best thing that you can do is hire them and get them on your team. And I think yeah. that he's done a really good job of doing that. Yeah. And I mean, I, he I'm, bought Tesla. He didn't, he didn't come up with it himself. Right. Right. You know? Yeah. But he fostered the growth of it. And that's yes. the thing, right? He 100%. bought it and he got it out there and he got it in people's yards. Yep. And that's, that's the key. I have one last question for you and then I'll let you go because we're running a little long tonight, but you have a comic book out. Yes. <laughs> so let's talk about this because I never would have guessed that you had a comic book. And I also, and I've, I saw this Marvel tag that you were associated with. Were you also in a comic book, but also put out your own comic book? Is that, is that accurate? Yes. One came before the other. Um, I was that. on a show called Mythbusters. Um, mm -hmm. And not the good seasons, like mm -hmm. the after season, the trying to rebirth Mythbusters. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and from there, uh, the Unstoppable Wasp had me and my friend from the show, Tamara, in the comic book. And we were uh, we were um, agents of girl uh, geniuses in research labs. And. From there, a comic writer contacted us and was like, "Hey, do you wanna, do you wanna create a comic?" And we were like, "Heck yeah!" And so we started uh, making Seekers of Science, and each issue has, you know, a real world issue. We don't have superpowers, you know, like we solve these problems with everything that we have right now because that's what I, that's what we really wanted the kids to, to understand is that they have the power to solve problems, to handle things, to build things, to do it all themselves. They don't need superpowers. Um, there's also a real expert uh, in every issue. There are real citizen science, community science scientists in every issue and a hands-on experiment. So it's a, it's kind of like a, a learning tool. But the thing is like, I hated reading. I still hate reading, um, <laughs> but I'll read a comic book. Mm. And I'm hoping that some of these kids that might not like to study for chemistry or physics, you know, just as long as they get through school and they're inspired, they can do anything they want in college or even after they can even work in the field, do something with environment, do something with, you know, technology or, or engineering. Um, even, it, you know, like it's the thing, like some of the smartest people aren't the ones that are book smart. They don't, you know, memorize everything. They learn yeah. by doing. And yeah. that's what needs to change in the schools is how we're teaching. And it is changing. But I mean, especially since we went to school and that was all textbooks. And yeah. now kids are actually doing things. In eighth grade, I was in a course called Calculators and Computers. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Is, and the and the computer was this someone, enormous deck writer computer that actually had the printer built into it. So it was just a keyboard with like a printer. It was there was not even a monitor. It just everything was on the paper. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, that's um, amazing. That's what it was like. Uh, but I actually I bought one of the first I got one of the first computers that ever came out, a Texas Instruments computer, and learned the basic programming language. I was like completely into computers before anybody was, and I love it. So That's glad so cool. that I've stayed on top of technology because it's really easy for older people to become dinosaurs with tech. They oh, just, yeah. they sort of get, you know, they just don't follow it after a while. And I, and I think that it's always weird. Like I don't, sometimes I don't think we'll get to Star Trek world in a way because there's not an, there's not enough ease of use. Like for a long time, Apple and Microsoft competed so much that the operating systems were just so vastly different. It was a huge learning curve. It felt like there's got to be like someone that gets market share so that you're just comfortable with something moving forward. Right. Apple winds up actually kind of winning that battle with touchscreen technology by kind of taking yeah. that and develop because now like there's not even really a need for the operating system. You can just use your touch screens and touch anything right. you want and get, and you can speak and it dictates everything you say. And, and I think we're getting there. Right. But it has yeah. to be so easy that any age can do it. Right. That's the key. Right. That's how we get to the future. It's so funny. Like you keep on saying things that like I say all the time, or I said today, and I was just telling my colleagues how with ocean modeling, we're doing it all like on this black screen interface and just writing code and hoping for the best. And I was just talking to them about how our workforce is suffering. Like we can't even hire people right now. 
because people that are in love with the ocean don't want to sit in front of a black screen. Like those two things are not going to match. Like yeah. we need easier ways for people to get involved and it's got to be so easy and so entertaining or so cool looking that people right. want to do it. That happens in astronomy too. A lot of people think, oh, I'm just always going to be looking through a telescope, looking at the stars. Oh, no, no, no. There's so much of that that's no. just on the computer. That's on the computer, it's, yeah. It's <laughs> dots and numbers and formulas and mathematics yeah, you, and you all this other You have your citizen scientists that can yeah. do the telescope stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, tell everyone how they can find you out there in the interwebs and social media. Um, at Inspector Planet. Uh, on, I'm mostly on Instagram, but my Facebook page uh, is run by my team and they do a fantastic job. If you want to stay up to date with all of the latest environmental news, that's where you go is, um, my Facebook page, but, but, or Instagram, my stores, um, YouTube, I'm rarely on there, but you can find some, some my rap video is on there. So you can find that. Yeah. Uh, and then the website that needs some set, update. set to ice, ice baby. Is that right? Set to ice, ice baby. Yeah. <laughs> so in general, watch the weather channel. <laughs> That's what you find me in there. I didn't want to bring up the music video because it's like, well, how can I really bring that up in, you know, an audio format like this? So, but everybody go check out the yeah. rap video because it's called polar it's... ice, ice baby. <laughs> and my That's interns great. are the characters in the video. That's great. Um, and people can get the comic book on Amazon. Is yep. it also available in comic shops? Uh, I think some comic shops at this point, but mm -hmm. it's mostly Amazon and uh, on the website, through the website. Sure. And we Great. have a new issue coming out right now. Actually, I think it's launched. Uh, and it's Perfect. it's based on uh, the University of Santa Clara's work in Uganda with aquaponics. So it's cool. That's great. Tracy, thanks for coming out today. It was really a pleasure. I hope you come back. Thank you so much for having me. I definitely will. Have a good day, okay? You too. Take care. Metacortex Publishing hopes that you've enjoyed this presentation. Please take a moment to listen to some other podcast offerings from Metacortex Publishing. The Danceology Podcast interviews the great masters of dance, the working professionals starring in today's most exciting shows, and the rising stars ready to amp up the craft. I'm your host, Edita Stavinska from Dancing with the Stars. Join me as I dive into the world of dance, uncovering unique stories and the fascinating personalities of industry professionals on Danceology. The No Earthly Explanation podcast investigates the things that are unexplainable, Hosted by world-renowned investigative researcher Donald R. Schmidt and scientist Ellie Ringo, follow them as they look for evidence for things that have no earthly explanation. Available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Cult Following is a podcast that studies the personalities and common traits of cult leaders and their followers. Get the real story behind these infamous and oftentimes tragic cults from a new perspective, through exhaustive research and from interviews with people that were there. Available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Father Daniel DePlantis, a Catholic priest, martial artist, and host of the Karate Priest Podcast. Have you ever wondered what the church teaches about different topics? Are you a martial arts enthusiast or just someone who wants to learn more about martial arts? I'd like to invite you to join me and many guests on my podcast as we cover topics of faith, everyday living, and martial arts on the Karate Priest Podcast. Hi everybody, I'm Amber Rose, the Religious Hippie, and I host the podcast A Catholic's Perspective. Join me every two weeks as I release episodes targeted towards helping young Catholics navigate their ever-changing secular world while staying strong in their faith. Whether you are a Catholic or not, all are welcome here. So if this is something that interests you, feel free to tune in. You can find A Catholic's Perspective on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I hope to see you there. Bye! Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and Anthony Smith and is distributed by Metacortex Publishing. 
This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.